you are listening to itrboxing.com radio with your host lukey so first off just introduce who you are okay um i'm louisa bang bang lulu i'm from perth australia and i'm wrecking hard so what um got you into boxing uh, you know, I was always pretty athletic as a kid, so um, I was invited to go to a kind of like a women's fitness group, and that was it. I just fell in love straight away and wanted to fight and got that, got that buzz, you know. And when did you, like, how extensive was your amateur career going into the, before you were a professional? <laughs> Not much at all. I um, pretty much had my first amateur fight after... Uh, not much training at all. Um, I I was able to have two amateur fights and then turn professional in 2014. So that's extremely active. Did you have a promoter behind you or were you um, selling a ton of tickets? Because that is a lot of activity. Um, yeah, I just, I just went professional and then I didn't have a promoter behind me. I just had to, do, had to hustle like everybody else and sell tickets. Yeah, and then you you won a title in Japan. How did that come about? I was offered the world title in 2015 um, to fight against the current champion at the time, and it was a couple of weights heavier than me, and I probably I was allowed probably a few weeks of training to prepare in the beginning. So I, I wanted the opportunity to fight for a world title. That was my goal. So I wanted to become the world champion. So I took the opportunity. And uh, so it so happened that the fight just got pushed back and pushed back with a lot of delays. And I ended up fighting it about 10 months after. So it ended up being, I guess, good for me. So I was able to prepare for the fight properly. Okay. So, so it was... Um you were aware of this fight happening and it just took forever because I see a ba- basically a year gap before you had, you had beaten someone that was three and O and I didn't realize this. You were fighting at basically a hundred pounds. What weight class is that? Yeah, I was fighting 102 pounds, which is Adam weight. And then I was offered the world title at light flyweight, which is, um, two weights heavier, 108 pounds. Okay. So that's crazy to me that, um, I get that you're in the smaller weight classes and on top of being in the smaller weight classes, women's boxing doesn't have as many opportunities as men's boxing, but still you don't hear of many fighters jumping two weight classes for a world title fight opportunity. No, especially I guess that early on in my career, it was my, it was my seventh professional fight. And like we just, I just told you I had two amateur fights. So, you know, under, under 10 fights, boxing fights in my life, you know, I became a world champion in my seventh fight. So, so how, do, how do you react to that, right? Because you're pretty green in the sport and now you're a world champion. How do you take that all in? I mean, just like everything. You practice practice your craft every day and be passionate about what you're doing and to get, be dedicated and disciplined and, you know, you can – just focus on things and it's amazing what you can do when you just put a hundred percent focus in. And what were your camps looking like up until this point? Like, did you have a full-time coach? Were you working full-time? What was the, what was the situation? Well, while I was in Australia I didn't have just one coach and it was, it was tricky to navigate. Um, like I said, I was just completely focused and, you know, focused on my goals. So I just did what I needed to do. Um, it wasn't until that I got to the U.S. and uh, thankfully with Elvis Grant that I was able to have proper training camps and, um, you know, have that foundation and that that loyalty with the team, you know. So then you come to the U.S. When did you come to the U.S. and when did you build a, a, a team in the U.S.? And how did that process come about? Uh, well, I was looking to make my way over here. Um, and it so happened that I met Elvis on Instagram and we started talking and we had a conversation about, you know, my goals and my dreams and things like that. And I came to meet him in 
since the end of 2017 to just get to know each other and see if we could do something together. And, and that was pretty much the history. <laughs> well, I mean, After that, I went back to Australia and I came back and we, we started preparing for fights. And, you know, we became very close. Uh, as you, I'm not sure if you're aware, but Elvis is also my boyfriend. So, you know, I got everything under the one roof. <laughs> That's like a happy story. That's like a like a boxing <laughs> like love story. The glove story. <laughs> yeah, that's it's. I feel like down the road you can actually make a movie and call that the glove story. I'm pretty sure we could. <laughs> it definitely had its. It definitely had its uh, stories involved. So it hasn't been easy by no by no means for. You know, for me as an athlete, for me as a mom, but also for Elvis. You know, like with the traveling back and forth to Australia and you know, being um, supporting me and like you said before, finding fights at that weight is super challenging. You know, it's um, it's hard to be recognized as such a small fighter and, and, you know, being a female, but he's done a fantastic job with me and been able to put me on some um, great shows and, and in front of some good media. So it's been a blessing. He's definitely worked his ass off. Yeah, talk about some of these um, kind of some of these – what, I guess the word would be limitations or um, hurdles that you face being a lower weight fighter and a woman in boxing. Yeah, we face, I think, full stop as a woman, you face a lot of different kind of hurdles. Um, you know, the challenges of having, I, I guess for every fighter though, you have challenges of having fights and then they fall through. Um, you know, a lot with the case, in my case, that, you know, seen me be inactive for a year because we've had opportunities that have fallen through. So that's definitely big hurdles. And like I said before, that was the hurdles I had when I was waiting to fight for the first world title. Um, challenges for me personally is, you know, being from Australia, uh, coming here to make, make a name of myself and to create something, uh, to chase the dream. I've got two children, so... It's never, never easy on my mind, you know. I, I'll definitely have a goal to be able to show them that you can dream big and that you can achieve things if you focus and you put the work in and you have the right passion for it. But it's never easy being away from them. So, you know, you know I know Elvis has felt the challenges of managing me and, and you know, finding, finding the fights and the opportunities. So it's just every day you work at it and you keep focused, you can, you can make things happen. Gonna be a hustler. Okay. That's so. Um, when this is all said and done, do you see your life more in California or Australia? Well, because of my children, it's always gonna be both. It can't be one or the other. My children are nine and twelve, so you know my my priority is obviously with them, and you know making the life. But I also in saying that I also wouldn't have them out here living with me full time either because. They have a father, and plus the life in Australia is really good for them. So they're in a they're in a really good lifestyle. So I wouldn't want to uproot them just just to be selfish. So I'm the one that has to kind of sacrifice that. Okay. Um, your first fight in America didn't go your way. Uh, what do you remember about that fight when you fought for the vacant WBC International Female Light Flyweight title? Yeah, I didn't get the decision, but you know, I had about ten days prepare for the fight and after such a huge layoff I think that I had some uh, ring rust um, so also you know I wanted to make a good impression so I had expectations on my shoulders but you know with 10 days to prepare for such a big fight it probably it was a challenge and um, you know it was a close fight I think it could have gone either way to be honest yeah I, I, I'd have to revisit. I remember it was. It felt like it was kind of a lot of fifty-fifty rounds. I don't. I can't say I'm an expert on this fight, but I did watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was close. And then, um, when did you? When did it kind of make? Or how would I say? When did it come together for you in the United States? In um, terms of boxing. As soon as I came here, you know, it was it wasn't like a, you know, didn't come with a plan. Like, it, of course, there's challenges and hurdles along the way that you just have to overcome or, you know, go around. Or, but there's always more ways to climb the mountain. I still feel like, you know, we're 
we're making our steps forward. I don't feel like, you know, it's everything is in sync completely. Uh, it's still a, a work in progress. And what's your, uh, who's your current trainer right now? That's also Elvis. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's got the good job of changing all the hats, you know? <laughs> so, El- <laughs> That is a lot of responsibility. <laughs> right? That is a lot of responsibility. I can barely handle one of those responsibilities, and he's handling a lot. Um, what's your yeah, fa- he is. What's your favorite venue you fought at so far? I would have to say it's um, the Stubbs. It's where I won the world title. Uh, you know, the forum has been good too, is where all the greats have fought. I mean, every every time is experience, but I think I've loved them all, to be honest with you. The last fight in New York, like, that was that was a dream for me. You know, a little Aussie girl from one of the most isolated cities in the world fighting in New York is, is pretty, pretty amazing. What do you remember about winning the world title at StubHub? I was just very hungry for it after, after what happened with Brenda Flores and then getting robbed that decision of winning the title. I was I was very teed up for it. And, you know, that was meant to be the rematch with her. And she pulled out 10 days before the fight. So as you could imagine, you know, it felt like Hagler in there. Okay. <laughs> hungry. You had the hunger. You had the desire. You were running in army boots. You were you were looking yeah, to take know, it from hungry, someone. But I, I definitely, I definitely hungry, sir. Okay. What do you want to get from boxing when it's all said and done? What do you want boxing to mean for you? I think, you know, I have my boxing goals, which is to become a four-time world champion. But when it's all said and done, you know, I, I would love to be able to use the platform of, of boxing to – to be able to empower and inspire a whole lot of other audiences and um, different kinds of audiences, especially people with uh, mental health that have um, find that challenging. Like, I would like to be able to, you know, be an inspiration to, to them to, to know that they can work through anything, um, having gone through it myself. You know, also for women, women in sports, it's very dear to my heart because since a young age I've been an athlete. Previously, I was a skateboarder, and I definitely felt that um, adversity of being a woman in a man's world. So that's definitely something that I would like to be doing, uh, speaking and running clinics, uh, workshops, things like that, to be able to help people with those blockages that they come across. And I don't know how comfortable you feel speaking about that, but it sounds like you face some adversity um, in terms of mental health. I'm unaware of that. Yeah. Do you feel comfortable sharing any aspects of that? Yeah, it's fine. Um, I went through a really severe depression um, that I wouldn't wish on anybody. It's a really, it really is an illness. And I suffered for about, in the grips of it, for you know a bit over a year. Um, there were moments where I didn't, didn't really feel like I wanted to be here. Um, and I just, I think that most of the reasons why I felt like that is obviously outside pressures. Like the, wor- like the world has always, it's always got pressures and we all, always need to know how to cope with them. And I was going through a lot of stress at the time and didn't really know how to cope with those things. But also alongside of that, I was young and I didn't, I didn't know the direction in life that I really wanted, you know. And I kept asking myself, you know, what am I doing? Where am I going? All of those kind of questions that I'm sure that everybody has. So once I kind of got got through that moment, I also found boxing on the other side of that. So it definitely helped me be able to, you know, have regain focus, um, give me purpose and direction in life and goals and aspirations. So, you know, I was always a pretty outgoing person before the, before I hit this person, but when I had that moment of certain the outside pressures, Without knowing how to cope, having those coping mechanisms, then, you know, it kind of just unfolded on me. 
So uh, what I'm hearing is like boxing kind of gave you a bit of structure and gave you a system. Thank you so much. Yes, I think one of the biggest things that boxing has taught me is um, discipline, you know, the amazing feeling you get from discipline. I guess growing up, discipline was always looked at as a bad thing, you know, a negative thing. But when you have self-discipline, it's such an empowering thing. That is that is a great perspective on something. <laughs> it's the truth, though. If you practice it, and and then you can high five yourself for being that way because it's not easy. Like it's easy to be caught up in so many things. What's the state of women's boxing currently to you? I think women's boxing is definitely on the up. You know, with women being on TV is a great thing. Um, I think sports in general for women are changing right now, which is awesome. So when you have the media and the ability to be on TV, that's when the sport grows, it's just just like it would in the men's. Like if it wasn't shown on TV, that it would be hard to grow the sport. You know, there would be no money involved because that's where it comes from, coverage and things like that. So women boxing is definitely, you know, at a very good, good place right now. And what's your goal um, when this whole COVID-19 gets done with, which I'm sure it will at some point? Um, what's your goal for the next year or so? Nah, this COVID got everybody at the grips. Um, yeah, I think, you know, continue to do what I'm doing. I obviously want to be making some great fights. You know, I think there's a good fight out there with Sinisa Estrada. That would be, you know, a pretty big fight between both of us. Um, that I definitely think would uh, be pulling, you know, the public's eye because it's an entertaining fight. So, well, um, sell us on that one. Know, Let's. I gotta stop you. You gotta sell me on. I'm a network executive or I'm a matchmaker. Sell me on why you two should fight. I think that Giles makes fights. Um, you know, she's definitely uh, climbing up her ladder as well, and we're in similar weight categories which is always the positive. Um, and it's, for, at the moment, it's the biggest fight for the lower weight. Um, you know, we're both exciting fighters in our own way, so when you put us two together, it's going to be great. And, you know, we're both good-looking girls. So. <laughs> and I'll, I'll just throw out a, a hypothetical. Let's say Canelo's coming back. He's rumored to be facing Golovkin. Why, why not put you all on the undercard? You know what? That's the perfect spot to be put in it. I mean, you know, I think definitely uh, with her, she just fought under under a Canelo fight with Marlene Esclaza, so it's the perfect place to put that kind of fight. It's definitely a fight that needs that needs to be, you know, on that kind of level. Well, that I just think of it as there. You're gonna have to charge a lot of money, and we're probably going into an economic. At best case scenario, recession, possibly a depression, right? So you're going to still be charging a lot of money, and you need to have Canelo, Ryan Garcia, and why not put you and Sinise as the third bout on the card at the, from the top? And it's like that's three action-packed fights. Right. I mean, Garcia got to fight somebody good, though. I th- I think he will because I think when I think that when we come out, um, people are going to gonna need to fight good people for the purses to make sense i think he'll fight someone i think it would be lenars what do you think about it all like what what is your what is your idea of it what's my idea of it i think it uh, i'll tell you um my first observation of covid19 is i feel every emotion every day so i'm super optimistic i hit depression for like one hour and then i'm back to being who i am so that's like yeah. probably what being in prison feels like. That's like I've never been arrested, but I'm assuming that's probably like what that feels like. As far as um, – I'm not really doing the conspiracy theories on it. I'm just like how can we get rid of this? That's kind of how I'm thinking right now because it's really inconvenient. I don't want people to die and it's really, really hurting the economy and it's just like – I'll say this. This is the only statement I feel comfortable saying on it. It definitely feels like the government knows something that they're not releasing to us because the numbers aren't necessarily correlating 
to the actions that are being taken. So it only makes sense that there's one extra part that I'm not aware of. Yeah, I think in situations like these, there's always more parts that the general public don't know about it. So this is a very tricky time for everybody, you know, and everybody's feeling those emotions that you just said. Um, you know, the ups and the downs of wondering what's going to happen, you know. How do you feel about this whole COVID-19? Because I just started doing radio interviews just because I'm bored as hell. Like, I miss going to boxing gyms. I miss interviewing fighters, doing my halfway decent videos. And now I'm interviewing people because I'm basically feeling like a prisoner. But how are you dealing with it as an athlete? Yeah, you know, I think COVID-19 has fucked up 2020 big time. You know, the dreams, the goals, um, the direction. But, you know, we just got to get through it. Everybody's in the same boat trying to deal with the same things, the unknown uncertainties of, of all of it. It's, I think, like you, I'm, I'm going through the different emotions. And, you know, one big thing for me right now is to be here in the States to be with my children. And, and that's very challenging for me to face. That's my own little personal issue that I'm going through. But um, on a world, like, I, I absolutely do agree with you that there's definitely something going on that we are not supposed to know about. And, you know, the trust issues, the trust within the, you know, the, the powerful people in the world that are running this world is, is, is really diminishing for the people because what, what is there to believe when there's so many different things coming out and so many, so many different opinions, um, so many different world leaders uh, reacting in different ways, you know? Why is one leader doing this and, and this one isn't? You know, we should we be looking at this as a whole to get rid of this thing? Well, I think for – and now everyone – we're doing a news podcast, but that's where this just went is um, Austria is opening up stuff next month. So Austria is probably going to be next to China, which I, I don't want to be mean, but I don't trust China's numbers on this virus. So, Hell no, I don't trust the Chinese at all, man. They fudged this stuff from the beginning, and the world might not be in this state if they were honest and contained it. So, I think that they've got a they've got a lot to be riding on their shoulders right now with the world the way that it is. It's bullshit. So, um, Austria is going to be our first case study of how life goes on without this virus, and I think that how Austria does will determine how boxing and sports in the U.S. and the world looks. Because if Austria can contain it, maybe we can have a 1,000 to 2,000 fans in a stadium to watch sports. If not, by July, we'll probably have empty arenas or high school gymnasiums with fights and basketball. Yeah, I mean, it's, so we've got to be optimistic in the way that we're thinking. But in the reality of the state of this country right now, I'm not sure the state of Austria and the numbers over there, but, you know, right now the U.S. is, is really suffering. So I'm, I, I really can't call it. I have no answers about it all. I'm just going to, you know, ride the ride and take the waves and, you know, take the dumpings with it too, but get back up and keep riding. Well, I'm I'm a big stats guy, and it said they say in California the, number, the days that we're supposed to look out for are – Coming up in two days. So it's really just think of it as Wednesdays. April 8th, April 15th, and April 24th, 25th. Those are supposed to be crucial markers for California upon when we should see surges. And if we can get through those dates without too bad of surges, we've flattened the curve in theory. And we should at some point start to see lesser cases. That according to stats, which stats are not rocket science or um, full reality. I think that the main chapter for the world right now, especially the leaders, is that there hasn't really, like, is there really a pattern of all of this? You know, um, can you really predict what it's going to do? Every country, I mean, it's been different, I think, in the way that it's, it's been affected, you know, in the way that it's... Uh, tried to control the situation and the numbers that have come from it. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's just a hard call, you know. How do you shut down a whole economy before that it's hit 
when people are asking, but well, hang on a minute, nothing's happening here. But then you wait for something to happen and it causes something catastrophic and harder to control. So what do you, what do, you do? Like, it's very hard to have answers for anything right now. It, for me, I'm just trying to plan, like, what is the world going to look like when we resume? Because I'm probably not going to shake people's hands for at least five years. And uh, it sounds funny, but I'm not. Like, it's changed my Wait, view of it. Wait, elbow bumping. That's it. The elbow bump. Yeah, but it's like <laughs> from social norms to, like, I'm not going to shake people's hands to what will waiting in line for – food look like when we get back because i'm probably going to stay a bit away from people and we used to crowd up in a chipotle line how is the world going to change yes i think i think people are going to be very cautious and very very and it's this is man this, this thing is just bottomed out bottomed the world out to, as we speak for the moment you know and, and the way that people are going to come back and rise up from this is you know, only time will tell. But I think that the community sticking together and everybody sharing positivity between each other and, um, you know, being there to help each other through these times, like you said, when you go through that depressing moment, it's okay to reach out to your support crew, your friends, your loved ones, because we're all feeling it so they can understand what you're going through. So, you know, to be able to talk each other through this time is is I think the most important thing and when the world comes back to normal I'm not really sure what that's going to look like but I don't think there'll be a big rush for it to be back the way that it was well my big thing is when when we're there's some sort of economy going I'm going to be really endorsing and backing any and all local businesses and whether that's whatever it is because I'm scared local business is going to get destroyed and we're going to just be left with big corporations you know what, I think that this is the huge lesson to be learned in all of this. It's like a lot of countries have relied on China to be manufacturing a lot of our things and there's a lot of capabilities in you know, in the US alone, in my country and Australia, to be manufacturing and making our own things to provide for our, for our people and to provide more jobs, to provide more income. You know what I mean? Like why does all of this stuff have to go offshore? It, you know, things are going to come back to being made in the U.S. Things are going to come back to being made in Australia, made in your own country. You know, there's no reason why why things can't be. Makes a lot of sense to me, man. Makes a lot of sense to me. That's, I think that that is going to be the biggest thing that will bring the economy back up again, is feeding your own economy, feeding your own people, rather than buying offshore all the time. You're taking away mass market for your own people well we're going we're going deep dive covid and economy (laughs) right here i'm appreciating it and i appreciate you taking time to just kick it with me because i'm just looking through all of my social medias looking for interesting people to talk with and i just appreciate you taking time to to kick it and just give me a 30 minute convo i really appreciate that yeah it's been cool okay where do they follow you on social media and stuff you can follow me on Instagram at Bang Bang Lulu and on Facebook, Louisa Horton. For more great shows, please go to iTunes or wherever podcasts are found and leave us a review.